That town down there, this wonderful old mission, we know we've got them pretty close to right. We took the measurements from the old and original drawings and plans. But the men who fought here, how can you measure men? How can you measure courage and human dignity and the desire for freedom? Well, how close we came to those men, you'll have to decide when you see our version of the story that Americans have been telling for six generations. And I'll keep on telling forever. Now, what is it about the Alamo that intrigued your dad so much that he spent a lot of his savings and devoted a good portion of his life into making that happen as a director and then kept giving away pieces of it to get it done. Eventually, with all of the distributions uh, and television, end up in, in the plus. But it was, um, it, my, my dad had a career where he, the, the studio knew that if he made a certain film, it was gonna make this amount of money. So you could make it for this and have a profit of this and you could pay him this and all of that. Well, my dad, you know, his, this, this was three times the budget uh, of a John Wayne movie. So they don't typically, uh, you know, just made the kind of money that a normal film would. But why he made the film, I mean, I, my guess is this, this guy came from a very humble beginning. He was born in Iowa. They, they made the trek across country to California. They didn't have anything. Uh, you know, my dad, he went to high school. He a high achiever in high school. He wanted to go to the Naval Academy. Couldn't get in there. Didn't have the political connections. He got a scholarship, a football scholarship to USC. And he broke his shoulder during the first summer and couldn't play football, lost his scholarship, couldn't afford to go to college. So he went to work where all these kids at SC went. They went to work in the film business. He was determined. He was very ambitious. And he was very driven to succeed. So. I mean, if any of those other things had happened, he went to the academy, Naval Academy, he'd been a Joint Chiefs of Staff. If he had graduated from USC, he would have been President of the United States. But as it happens, he went to, you know, back into the movie business, it became this huge thing. But what it did was, for a person who is ambitious, what this country offered him was an opportunity. And he never lost sight of that or appreci you know, appreciated the fact that if you're willing to work, you can, you can succeed here. And I think, you know, he, he loved that about this country and wanted to talk about something that was great about this country. And I think that the, the story and the vision of the Alamo represented that. He believed in the Alamo so much himself, he transferred his thoughts to other people. This adobe chapel is a monument to a defeat. This is where Davy Crockett William Travis Jim Bowie 179 other fighting men lost the battle which won the war for the Texan independence. And he went in to make the Alamo before he had all of it, you know. He didn't even have all his money when he started. And he just, uh, he jumped from post to post. Took a lot of guts. At that time, he was in, under contract to Republic Studios, and he had a very close association with the head of the studios, Herb Yates. And every time that uh, he came up and wanted to start work on the Alamo, Yates would kind of push it aside and push it aside and push it aside. 
John Wayne broke his association with Herb Yates and went off on his own to make the Alamo. He believed that it was an important film to make, despite the negative attitude of the studios, who would only support the film if he used a known director like John Ford. Well, my first contact with John Wayne was in Mexico City, and he told me he was going to do a story of the Alamo, and I must be his art director. I said, well, that's fine with me. My father had intended to make it uh, outside of the country. In fact, um, he, was, uh, he had locations picked in Panama and also in Mexico. He got a letter from Dollars of the Public saying if he ever shot the picture in Mexico, he could never show it in Texas. Happy Sheehan finally persuaded Wayne to shoot the picture in Texas, offering his 20,000-acre ranch at Brackettville as the primary location. So Wayne and I went down, and we looked over the situation, and uh, as far as Wayne was concerned, it looked like it was a good place. Now, this was a vast, vast open field, miles and miles around, with nothing but, but brush. When uh, Wayne came down here on the ranch, he asked me who's going to build it. Well, he knew I was a contractor, but he said, well, who's, who's your builder? I said, a uh, man named Chato Hernandez. Didn't finish the third grade in Mexico, but he can build it. So he said he'd like to meet him, so I sent a man in town, picked him up, brought him back out. They, and when, when he got out of the car, I watched Wayne look at him, and he shook his head. I know what he was thinking. He looked down at Chato and he said, Chato, do you think you can build Alamo? And Chato, he looked up in his broken English and he said, Mr. Wayne, you think you can make a picture? And Wayne just blew his mind. He just fell back. Those buildings were built practically. Um, they were built practically, but they were to be able to be built to, 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 to film inside so that you didn't have to go on a soundstage and pay those horrific rents and overheads that you get when you go on to a major studio lot. That town down there, this wonderful old mission, we know we've got them pretty close to right. We took the measurements from the old and original drawings and plans. But the men who fought here, how can you measure men? How can you measure courage and human dignity? and the desire for freedom. Well, how close we came to those men, you'll have to decide when you see our version of the story that Americans have been telling for six generations, and I'll keep on telling forever. I'm a street kid. I mean, I'm from the, the, the neighborhoods of South Philadelphia, you know. Um, when I got to the wide open spaces of Texas in the middle of Brackettville, and, uh, I mean, I, I didn't know where I was. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I, I just had no idea, uh, I mean, uh, to be exposed to the elements of, of scorpions and, and skunks and rattlesnakes. I mean, I, mean, I knew about rats, but <laughs> that's about it. I think most of, of the cast got down uh, to the uh, location, uh, Brackettville, in about the middle of September, but Duke had gone down two or three weeks before and was shooting a lot of the background. And I never saw so many people in my life in the background. He had the hills lined up with people. I was standing there in the crowd at Fort Clark, and out comes John Wayne and Bob Rillier and his entourage. And he looks the group over and says, now I'm gonna pick out, I've got how many, 17 or 18 of you. You're gonna play the parts of the Tennesseans. So he looks the crowd over and he, he spies me and he walks right up to me. The first one says, you. And you know, I couldn't believe it. I thought he was talking to the guy behind me. Cantina, do it mean what I think it do? It do. Do chastise mean what I think it do? It do. Hmm. Duke thought that was very funny the way I said, it do. So he began to make up little scenes where I would say, it do. He believed in the individual, and he, he, he hated groups of people. Even the guys, he tried to make the Tennesseans have a certain look, but each one had, you know, different wardrobe. I mean, it didn't look like an army. A group of individuals, a group of people that felt the same way. 
but they were all different. And he had a wild divergence in personalities there. When you have a, a man like uh, Richard Widmark, and you have uh, Lawrence Harvey, a fine, fine English Shakespearean actor. He just had scars that never felt a wound, but soft. What light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. <laughs> Arise for your son and kill that envious mood. <laughs> he ran on Pouli Fousse. He was always, uh, uh, seemed to be at ease. And he was kind of out of his uh, element, I, I would say. But uh, he was a lot of fun to work with and got along very well with Duke. And I turned around and there was this tall, tall man. And I said, me? Because I looked around and there was nobody else. He said, yes, you, you. Uh, I, who are you? What's your name? And I gave him my name. And he said, I am John Wayne. And I said, oh, right <laughs> up here. I was very impressed there was John Wayne. I mean, in person, right? <laughs> so he said, I want you to know that I am going to be making a film someday. And you will be my leading lady. And the film is going to call The Alamo. And I said, oh, well, thank you. But I took it. You know, like someone you say when you had maybe a couple of drinks after dinner and, uh, you know, and it wasn't going to, uh, I didn't even take it seriously, but I thank him very much and walked away and didn't even comment about it. But do you know that two years went by or a year and a half or so and I got a phone call and the voice on the other side, I have forgotten all about it, said, is this uh, Miss Crystal? Yes. This is John, this is Duke Wayne. This is Duke Wayne. And I'm ready to do the Alamo now. And I want you to play my living lady. And I just fell off the, the chair. His greatest weaknesses were his strongest assets. And what I mean by that is loyalty. That's an asset. That's a, that's a quality, to have loyalty for people. But it was loyalty to a fault. If you were a friend of his, you could do no wrong. I've made all of his pictures, with a few exceptions. Um, going back to 1952, when I signed a contract with him. And uh, I stayed with him until I retired. There's nothing like it that I know of in history that compares to what happened at the Alamo. And I think Duke wanted to make a statement about that. And he selected the people that were in that picture. So many of them he selected himself. And so the people that worked it, the stuntmen and all, they all felt they were part of something. People believed him when he played Davy Crockett. People believed him when he played uh, a cowboy or a sheriff. My father was a movie star. He was not a cowboy. You know, he was not a sheriff. He was not Davy Crockett. He knew, I think, how people wanted to see him. And the Alamo was a case uh, playing Davy Crockett. They obviously, they wanted to see him playing Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett symbolized the American frontier, the backwoods individual. Like John Wayne, Crockett was a media product of his time. The historical Crockett was elected twice to Congress, but the mythological figure in the Almanacs was a brutal adventurer, an eye-gouging, ring-tailed roarer who could whoop his weight in wildcats. Crockett symbolized the myth of the frontier. His coonskin cap and deerskin clothes signified his closeness to nature, an idealized time when American values were established as a result of man's contact with the wilderness. Wayne and Crockett were both 50 years old when they chose the Texas frontier for a new beginning. His life was one of constant conflict against the system. He was outside the system. He was not a part of the system. He was an individual. And don't forget, John Wayne left Herb Yates, left Republic Studios over a dispute on, uh, over a dispute on the Alamo. My dad was in his crawl for, the ten, for 10 years. He wanted to make a story of the Alamo, and there wasn't going to be anything that would deter him from that. Yeah. 
O Almighty God, centuries ago Thou raised a magnificent mission, a harbor for all of peace and freedom. This was the Alamo. Today we ask Thy blessing, Thy help, and Thy protection, as once again history is relived in this production. We ask that this film, The Alamo, be the world's outstanding production. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns world without end. Amen. I was there the first day of filming on the Alamo Village set. It was real touching that I prayed and I prayed that everything would go well and no one would be hurt and uh, asked God's blessing on the filming. And I thought that was, that was something. I was impressed. The first day when we started filming on September the 2nd, I went out there and I had my uniform on. It was brand new. And uh, they began to throw mud on me and looked like we'd been in the mud in a long ride to San Antonio. And I looked over there to Richard Boone, who was playing the part of Sam Houston, and had a full beard on him. And uh, very quietly, I told Mr. Wayne, I said, uh, as your historian, I will respectfully tell you, sir, that I don't believe he had a, a beard. And uh, he said, well, I declare I didn't know that. And so he, he, we shaved that beard off of Mr. Boone. He was very outgoing on a surface level. I had the feeling he was very unpredictable, that there was a short temper there, but he was under terrific pressure. Blue Norther had come through that day when they shot this scene. So mist was coming off the water because the air temperature was really cold. I suddenly was aware that the dancers in the background beyond the lawn, which was supposed to be up at Santa Ana's headquarters, were standing there like this. They had never been cued. He said, all right, that's too bad. We'll do it again. And since we have an opportunity to do it again, I would like, and he then gave some specific notes to some of the guys moving with him, some of the people over on the far shore. He made very subtle changes, but I was fascinated. He was furious and he really exploded. And then he closed down and got this control. And he said, and now make goddamn sure that the dancers dance. Just like any other tough director, if you knew your job, you're fine. If you, uh, if you screw up, you're in Dutch. <laughs> He had a terrific imagination, and he did know the picture business. And he knew how to get the shots. Well, he just doesn't BS you. He tells you like it is. While they were filming, there were four ladies, and they started talking. And you could hear them talking while the filming was going on. Well, Duke blew his stack. They were behind him. And he blurted out a string of by blasted dead gum GDs, SOBs, women, ruining my scene, you know. And when he turned around to look, it was four Catholic nuns in their habit that was doing the talking. And when he saw who it was, it got so quiet, you could have heard a rat coughing in the Alamo, you know. And Duke got the funniest look on his face and said, well, excuse me, sisters, but says, you know, we're making a movie here. <laughs> it was a big job. It was a big job for Duke. There's no question about it. But uh, he did it, and, uh, and he did a good job. But he, I think he realized when it was over that it was too much and it wasn't worth it. Either direct the picture, but don't act in it, or act and don't direct the picture. I do think that uh, Duke uh, overextended himself, you know, producing it and starring in it and directing it. I think it was a, a, a huge chore. And I think that... Uh, it would have eased things a great deal for him had he had, let's say, a John Ford directing it. 
John Ford was known as one of the great Hollywood directors and made some of Wayne's best films. These films reflected Ford's ambivalence to the possibility of ordinary people acting without strong leaders. He was an autocratic leader himself who manipulated people to get results. Ford arrived uninvited on the set early in the production. Wayne had tremendous respect for him, you know, but Ford and and Ford was worried about Wayne, you know, getting it right. Well, he was a guy who made Wayne. You know, he was a guy that took Wayne and put him in stagecoach in 1939. Ford was great for Duke because he he was the only, uh, well, not the only director, but I I always felt that he was the best director for Duke because he. He, uh, when, when he said jump, uh, it, was, it was a jump situation, you know what I mean? Wayne had nothing but respect for Ford anyway, you know, and also fear. He had, oh, well, you, know, you know, he had fear of Ford. Everybody had fear of Ford. As a matter of fact, Duke Wayne came to me and said, Bill, I don't know what I'm going to do with Ford. He goes, when he come to visit us, he got his director's chair and he sat right beside the camera like he was directing the picture. And John Wayne said, oh, to me, what the hell can I do with this? And I said, well, let's get him a camera. I've got an extra cameraman here that's not just sitting on a set. So let's send him out with Jack Ford and let Jack Ford shoot some chases and see how he likes that. I got the opportunity to work very closely with Mr. Ford uh, during that period of time. <laughs> <laughs> it was always a challenge. <laughs> Uh, I remember my father saying, uh, whatever you do, don't let him talk to any of the principals in this film. Ford had a handkerchief in his mouth, best I can remember. He always went around one like that. And he just looked at me and then just turned his back on me like this. And I felt like a fool. And Duke says, that's all right, Dude, you, you can go back now. So I went and sat down and I thought, what is that all about? Well, about 30 minutes later, I get a call to report to Mr. Ford, and he's got a whole camera crew, and Duke has sent him out to film scenes of me doing things. So for a day or two, I'm with Mr. Ford on another unit, and he's filming all these scenes, and I'm thinking, Rudy, you're gonna be a star. <laughs> John Ford is directing all these scenes, and I'm the central character, and I can't believe that this has happened. I've heard it said that none of that footage that Ford filmed was ever used in the picture, but I can attest that's not right. He is the one that filmed Chuck Robertson in my death scene. He wanted me to have a particular look on my face, and I never did get it, but he was trying to help me get it. And he said, uh, thumb your nose at me. And I thought, he said, I said, thumb your nose at me. So I went like this, you know. He said, all right, now do the same thing, but don't put your hand up there and make the same face. And he was trying to help me get the look. He wanted me to give a kind of a look, you know. Wayne didn't have the way with actors or people that Mr. Ford had. Duke was great for directing action because he had then had done so many action films, you know, and for getting rough battle scenes and stuff. But uh, directing actors, I wasn't uh, all that pleased with him because everything that he told you to do was a uh, <laughs> was what with all of his mannerisms, you know, which, which nobody else could do. He he had the corner on that situation. I remember a scene in there where like Pat Wayne comes riding back in the Alamo. You notice him take the drink of water and throw the dipper into the bucket. Well, guess whose action that was? It was Wayne. He knew how to play this his character, John Wayne. And he played it better than anybody you know, and there's a lot of guys have tried to play him you know, that blow it, mm -hmm. but nobody could play his big man. And Ford taught him that. Ford taught him how to walk, how to move, you know. Did you notice that he tried to make everybody in there look good at some time? Um, for example, of course, he made the Texas Defenders look good, you know, fighting for freedom. And then later when uh, Santa Ana offered the non competents to come out, the women and children. He was going to allow them to leave. Well, he was making a statement there. They had dignity and gallantry themselves. So he was showing the Mexican army had good points to them. And then there was the, the Negro 
Jethro. Well, he was a, a slave. And yet when Travis drew the line on the ground, he was the second man that crossed over and said he would stay. So he was making the black race look dignified and noble and gallant. The crucial moment of the Alamo story is the crossing of the line. Ten days into the siege, Colonel Travis assembled his men. He told them he had deceived them with promises of help. Then he drew a line with his sword and invited all who would stay and die with him to cross over. It's really a great story that these guys had a choice. They could have, they could have run. They absolutely could have got out of here. And they didn't do it. That's a sensational story. Conservative historians were reluctant to believe in the drawing of the line, which is central to the Alamo myth. As Texas folklorist J. Frank Doby writes, what makes history live is that part of it that appeals to the imagination. If you lose the moment of the line, the story is somehow diminished. For this is the moment of moral choice in which the defenders of the Alamo decide to die together. He did not actually draw a line in the Alamo, and I thought that was such a dramatic thing that they should have had him draw a line with a sword and have everybody step over. But he didn't. He simply asked those that wanted to stay to join him. That was the only place I thought the, the script was weak. And it surprises me that Duke didn't insist on that. Russell Birdwell, who was a PR man, and James Edward Grant, who was a writer, said, nobody ever, nobody knows that but Texans. And I said, I'll tell you one thing. We argued that from 11 o'clock one night till 3.30 the next morning. In Wayne's film, Travis does not draw the line, but the essential moment of choice is presented. Travis levels with the men. He speaks to them from the ground and for the first time tells them the truth of their situation, that there will be no help. I noticed that too, that I started to cross the line before Wayne did, and I did so on their instruction. And you would think that this, the second person to cross would have, or the first would have been Wayne. The only reason that I could think that he waited to get down, if you had to analyze it, was maybe he was proud to see his Tennessee guys going across without him having to tell them to. It's just a big production. We had a lot of people. As I recall, we had 2,000 horses in it, 2,200 20, horses maybe. And, and then we had to have 2,200 2,200 2, riders. And uh, had a tremendous cast, which you certainly well know, many, most of which, uh, the, some of which are dead now, deceased. But great fellows, great cast. And then it called for so many unusual scenes battle scenes, band scenes, and massive mountainside scenes with 2,000 riders in scope of the cameras. You've got to bear in mind, if I haven't said it, I'll repeat, that he was the director, producer, and star of that show. That's an awful big mammoth undertaking for any one person to do. And it appeared that that was too much for any one man, including Duke. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison are to be put to the sword if the ford is taken. I have answered the demand with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly from these walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character 
to come to our aid. If this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is his due, is his own honor, and that of his country. Victory or death. Signed, William Barrett Travis. I remember when, one day when we were shooting the scene up on top of the mission, and uh, the Mexican army comes riding up, Carlos Arusa on a horse, and he looks great and he's dancing around, and, and he says, uh, you know, leave the fort or we'll kill all of you. At that point, Harvey takes his cigar and fires the cannon. The cannon recoils and comes down, and uh, they play a little more of the scene. But when it came down, it came down in his foot. A, a real cannon came down his foot and smashed his foot to smithereens, broke it like you can't believe it. But he didn't do, he didn't grimace in the scene. These, these were professional men. They knew what they were doing. Harvey was a professional actor. He knew his business. The script called for 400 Longhorns. He wanted them, he needed them. He couldn't get them. He himself, the big man himself, could not get them. So anyway, he said, take a plane, and so I agreed to do it. I knew that Cap Yates, another friend, a dear friend at Marfa, Texas, had some big, big old steers. Uh, old Cap Yates, you know, oil field Yates and everything, and sat out on the back porch and talked old times, and he said, well, what in the world can I do for you? And, and what, are you, what are you doing way out here? And I said, well, I came to see you. I wanted to talk old times. Boy, that's good, he said, talk old times. And I told him then that I needed to borrow some of his steers to be used in the film of the Alamo. He said, I'll let you have all you want, provided you do one thing. And I didn't know what in the world he was making to say. You know, I hadn't spent any money. I'd got them all for free. And I knew I was going to get his for free, but I couldn't figure what he's fixing to say. He said, if you if you just spend the night, and, and where we can talk tonight, he says, you know, I'm so old, I can't, there's nobody left around that can talk steers like y'all and longhorns and cattle and, and all. He said, if you'll spend the night and we talk and visit, and, 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 the, and his boy sitting there, he said, yeah, and in the morning, he said, we'll have a good time, we'll rope one. I'll rope one and you rope one. Well, that, you know, my fingers, fingers always itching to rope a, a steer anyway, so we, I agreed. And, by Saturday, I had those 400 Longhorns. It didn't cost our company a penny. liked them and I researched all these things and saw what they had available at Western Costume and we put together the Mexican Army with so many units <laughs> uh, like 200 uniforms of this kind of group and 200 uniforms or 400 of this kind and that all those uniforms were authentic uniforms. Mexicans really got in the spirit of the thing. They, a lot of them put rocks in their muskets. They were, <laughs> a lot of them wanted to be lancers, but they could ride a horse and stick somebody. Take a beat there. It's it's choreography, just like just like a dance routine. If you get hurt, you're bound to get hurt. If, otherwise, you wouldn't be there. They wouldn't be paying you the, the dough that they pay you. You got it, acrobats, water people, high fall people sword people, and mine was horses. 
And of course, it's not easy with horses because you got 1,200 pounds to deal with and they're not that smart. So they get on you. I think that's the best saddle fall I've ever seen in a picture. And it was done by Chuck Hayward. He was in total control of the fall at all times. One hand held onto a strap on the saddle. And after he had fallen in midair and he hit the end of that strap, it kind of lined him out. And when he hit the ground, he spun. It just was so spectacular looking. The guy that got kicked and lost a hearing in one ear, doing a drag, yeah. So you're going to get hurt. You can't help that. So John Wayne's swinging his torch, you know, and swacking a Mexican here and there with it. And then here's the 400 guys come in, and this one guy runs in, he's going to stick him with the lance. And this guy trips and falls, and he knocks himself out, stuns himself, he falls down, and he's stunned. And so the rest of these guys, they all stand around not knowing what to do. <laughs> And they're standing like this, and John Wayne is saying, stick me, stick me, stick me. And he's going like this, stick me, stick me, stick me, damn it, stick me. Principal photography ended on December 20th, 1959, after 83 days of shooting. Motion pictures are commercial ventures, but Wayne wanted more than money. John loved the Alamo as a man loves a woman once in a lifetime, passionately. It was too close to him to see it even. Well, I'll tell you, we had some bad publicity, and uh, Duke made a mistake. We, he, uh, they hired a guy, a publicity man, and they gave him, I think, something like a half a million dollars to spend on publicity. And this guy stepped on a lot of people's toes. The advertising campaign that Russell Birdwell uh, conducted uh, after my father went to Africa, and mainly for the, uh, for the Academy Awards, uh, was uh, just in unbelievably poor taste. The Alamo was nominated for seven Academy Awards Birdwell challenged the Hollywood community. If they didn't vote for the Alamo, they were un-American. A barrage of ads both for and against the Alamo followed until Chill Wills capped the episode with his own ad. We of the Alamo cast are praying harder than the real Texans prayed for their lives in the Alamo for Chill Wills to win the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. Cousin Chill's acting was great. Your Alamo Cousins. Groucho Marx responded that he was glad to have Chill Wills for a cousin, but that he was still voting for someone else. And that year we were nominated, I think, for seven awards, and we only won one. And Duke and I got together and had a couple drinks at the party afterwards. And he says, son of a gun, he says, Jesus Christ, all of this work, and he says, I thought we'd come up with something. He wanted to make a classic. Right. And I think it was always, I think he went to his grave, knowing that it was a classic, but he didn't get credit for one. When I die, take my saddle from the wall, put it on to my pony, and lead him from his stall. Tie my bones to the saddle, turn our faces to the west, and we'll follow the trail that we love best. Ride around, little doggies, ride around them slow, cause the fiery and the snuffy are raring to go. Bowie, Crockett, Travis and Dickinson and the others who died in the Alamo. Held off an army for 13 days, yet it's hard to believe that they ever existed. Had become legends before the smoke over the battle had blown away. 
What kind of men were they? Well, we know that they died and that they were heroes. But nobody wants to die, and nobody just decided to be a hero. Has to be forced on you. That's what happened to them. It was forced on them because they were stuck with ideas like freedom and the rights of the individual and a hatred of dictators. Crockett, for instance, refused to sign the oath of allegiance to the government of Texas until they changed it to the Republican government of Texas. Living free meant a lot more to them than cowering in security. Another thing about Crockett, when he left for the Alamo, he sent his children this message. I hope you'll do the best you can. I'll do the same. Don't be uneasy about me. I'm with my friends. Worked out just about that way. He stayed with his friends, and he did the best he could.